Uh, we're so excited to have uh, our brother Joel Richardson back with us. So if you would, extend, uh, extend an invitation and an ovation for, for Joel as he comes forth to bring the word. I feel like, um, without a doubt, uh, Joel is a is a he's had a voice uh, for a long time, not just like a, an actual voice because you've had that for a while, but a, a prophetic voice for the season in which we are living. Uh, I, I believe he's had this for a long time, but it is even more imperative now that we who have ears to hear hear. And so I just pray right now over this word today that uh, that that it would be one that is needed. I pray in Jesus' name that it would go forth as, um, uh, as purposeful as a sword to divide truth, to, uh, to cut away uh, even misconceptions that, that, have, that have been placed and that people have carried on to. I thank you, Lord, for this one and for the one uh, for the call that's on his life. And I pray in Jesus' name that your, that your word would come as, uh, as weight that it would carry and that it would fulfill everything that it's sent out to do. So bless Joel, anoint him, and bless those who hear the word this day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Bless you, brother. Well, I want to thank my little buddy T.W. for the um, invitation. My God, they said my little buddy Jake. You pre do you just say that about everyone? I just want to welcome my little buddy um, and uh, no, but it is good to be back here. Uh, just had the actually really enjoyable little cruise out from Kansas City yesterday, and um, it's a it's a blessing to be here in Southern Illinois. So, what's up, Bobby? Um, I my real name. A lot of people don't know my real name is Richard, um, but growing up, I was called Ricky. So whenever I meet someone called Bobby, anyway, there's always a Ricky Bobby joke in the back of my head. Um, but it wouldn't make sense to most people because you don't know my real name, but now you do. But only my mother gets to call me Ricky, by the way. Um, my mother and maybe my sisters. I think at th probably 13, I was like, I want to go by Rick. But uh, anyway, long story. So um, T.W. asked me if I could speak about the end times. Uh, today, and so I have the incredibly creative title for today's session, which is um, The End Times. <laughs> and I didn't come up with anything more creative, but um, I do trust that the content is a little bit better than the title. Um, I tried to put together this discussion in such a way that it would be, it would be beneficial not only for believers who study the end times, who are interested in this subject, but also, quite frankly, for someone who may have zero interest in this subject and maybe is even wrestling with their faith, someone who's not even quite sure if they're even a Christian or if they're on the fence. Because what's interesting is that when you look at the way that most Christians um, approach the subject of apologetics. So apologetics is the sort of field of defending the faith. They often do so, they get into philosophy, they get into history, they get into all sorts of different argumentations. And I think all of those things are valid. A lot of people love to get into creationism and, you know, there's all sorts of things. Um, again, little different sort of subsets of apologetics. But when you look at the Bible... When you look at the, the primary way that the faithful, you know, the apostles themselves, how did they defend the validity of the faith? Most often, what they actually used, is it really two things, to be fair, is the, they used the power of God. So they would be like, hey, look, I'm just a bozo just like you. Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. and So the, the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit was a profound validator of their message. Absolutely. So the power of the Holy Spirit, but also, and this is probably like the huge untouched field within apologetics or evangelism, you know, which, again, apologetics is the effort to defend the faith. Evangelism is sort of the effort to convince people 
to embrace the faith, but so that sort of the, the untouched uh, tool, if you will, in the apostles' tool chest for apologetics and evangelism was biblical prophecy. It's something that you almost never see modern-day Christian apologists use to validate the faith. But you look at the apostles, or Jesus, or really any of them, and they're like, this is happening right now. What you just saw happen today is to fulfill the words of the prophets. And then they point to the prophets. And people go, oh, wow, Isaiah did say that 900 years ago. Like, wow. And so when you look at recent American history... You look at the most significant time in recent American history where people were swept into the faith. Much of it was during the Jesus people movement. We haven't seen a move like that in quite some time. If you saw the Jesus revolution, is that what it was called? The movie, I loved it. Even my kids loved it. I think it was the first Christian movie that my kids really loved. Um, I think my daughter liked the part before the hippies became Christians. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, when you look at that whole time period as all of these hippies and so many people were were embracing the faith, a big part of it, again, was the move of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was moving. But a lot of people, we talked about it last night, we had a little dinner with some of the pastors, but one of the books that during that period, quite frankly, scared the hell out of a lot of people, I mean that in a few different ways, um, was the book The Late Great Planet Earth. And so it was a very incredibly popular book written by Hal Lindsey. And so people were reading this book talking about the end times and they were going, oh my gosh, like, you mean this book is true? And they were like, well, so if all the prophetic parts are true, which, you know, as ground reality, as realities in the earth are unfolding, people looked at it and they go, this is true. They go, that must mean all these other parts that say you must repent and actually live for God and live for your creator and live according to his commandments, his ways, his instructions. Otherwise, destruction is your destiny. They go, I guess that part's true as well. And so people were repenting of their sins and being baptized. It was a beautiful thing. But we don't often think of the fact that the greatest revival in recent American history, one of the primary um, reasons behind it, the primary fuel behind it, It was really two things. I'm kind of making up this sermon as I go. But it was the move of the Holy Spirit, and it was biblical prophecy. So when we talk about the end times, most often people, they have all kinds of different ideas in their heads. They think, well, the end of the world. Or they watch that movie that just came out on Netflix. What's it called? Escape this world or something? I don't know. It's some weird movie about the end of the world, and it doesn't really make sense. Somebody said the Obamas were part of making it or something. Yeah, is that true or is that just on TikTok? Yeah. It's hard to know. Is it reality or is it TikTok? Um, We have to verify these things. But people often think of the Bible teaches or talks about the end of the world. No, it doesn't. It talks about the end of this current, wicked, corrupt, fallen, broken system and the end of this age, and the transition into a new system, a new government, both of the rejection and the end of corrupt political leaders, both on the earth and corrupt spiritual principalities governing the earth. We won't get into that. And the reestablishment of humble servant leaders that will govern the earth including Jesus on the throne in Jerusalem, it's the end of this current fallen age, and it's the restoration of Eden. Okay, so the the reality is what the Bible teaches when we talk about the end times, it's a beautiful story. It's not just about horrific things and apocalyptic, you know, Hollywood, Armageddon, and all of these things. So Jesus refers to this in Matthew 24, verse 7 through 9. This is his sermon We call it the Olivet Discourse. It's Jesus' sermon on the end times. He's talking about the last days. He says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In various places, there will be famines and earthquakes, all of the typical apocalyptic stuff, you know, earthquakes, plagues, pestilences. And he goes, but listen, all of these things are just the beginning of birth pains. And he uses the analogy of a birth. Now, 
you've got a house here filled with kids and children and so forth, so most of you understand how these things work with regard to birth and pregnancy and yada yada, and the reality is you don't look at the due date as the end of the world. Well, it's a little bit, but not, not really, but we don't look at it as, oh no, the due date's coming. You're excited for the due date. You're excited for the birth. And that's how we should, and all people should feel about what the Bible talks about with regard to the end times. But yes, there is birth pains. You can't have a birth, you know, I know C-sections and all that. But in Jesus' day, they didn't have C-sections. They didn't have epidurals. Um, or I don't even think they had those weird blow-up tanks that you can have babies at home or whatever. I mean, you know, it was just, there's the field. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, you know, things were a little rougher back then, but the point is there was birth pains and then birth, and you look forward to the birth. And the reality is if we understand what the Bible says about the last days, it's something we should look forward to. We're not excited about the birth pains. Of course not. We're not weirdos. But birth pains are part of the process. We're looking forward to that which is on the other side of the birth pains. Okay, so it's important to start out just to contextualize this whole issue of the last days. It's not some horrible, nightmarish, weird Hollywood horror movie. It's difficult times are coming. They're already here. They're already here, but on the other side of that is the return of Jesus the establishment of the humble servant king on the throne in Jerusalem, the ways of God, the knowledge of God covering the earth, the law of God going out from Jerusalem, the nations being discipled, the restoration of Eden. It's a beautiful picture. Now, I want to talk about a handful of different things that, in my opinion, these things are clearly taught in the Bible, clearly foundational matters taught in the Bible that prove that this book is true, that it's inspired by God, and it's something we should pay attention to. These are subjects that a lot of people don't often talk about. So I want to begin by talking about the blessings and the curses of the Mosaic Covenant. Whoa, we just went from very simple to some pretty deep stuff. Okay, so if you are familiar with the Bible, you know that Israel... The Lord led them out of Egypt in the Exodus. They traveled across the Sinai Peninsula. They got to Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, God came down in smoke and fire and a thick cloud. He settled on the mountain. And with thunder, he entered into, he spoke, and he entered into a covenant with all of Israel that was at the base of the mountain. And if we understand that covenant as it's intended to be understood by the Bible, then we recognize that that covenant was essentially a marriage covenant. Technically, it was a betrothal covenant. So it's like a precursor to marriage. We won't unpack that all now, but the Lord entered into a covenant with Israel. Think of it as a marriage covenant. We can all understand and relate to a marriage covenant. And central to this marriage covenant, this, this commitment between God and Israel are what are called the blessings and the curses of the covenant. Okay, so when we talk about the law, we talk about Torah, we talk about the, the commandments, the regulations, the decrees, the ways of God, the instructions that he gave to Israel at Mount Sinai, that's part of the Mosaic, sometimes we call it the Sinaitic covenant, which means the covenant at Mount Sinai, or we call it the Mosaic covenant because it was given through Moses, but part and parcel of that are what are called the blessings and the curses of the covenant. And these are very simple. So the blessings of the covenant, we read about them in quite a few places. Deuteronomy chapter 4, Leviticus 26, here in verses 3 through 5, the Lord says, If, now notice the if, it's conditional. If you walk in my statutes. And in, in this principle, by the way, applies to all of us. If we obey God then good things result. It's not saying your life will perfectly always be blessed and wonderful and you won't have suffering and pain. In fact, Jesus said, if you follow me, you'll have tribulation, persecutions. You know, there is still suffering. But following Jesus is a heck of a lot better than not following Jesus. Let's just put it that way. Living as a believer is a heck of a lot better than being a stupid 
drug addict, pothead. I don't mean if you're a drug addict, I didn't mean to call you stupid. I just mean that's who I formerly was, stupid little drug addict. So the Lord says, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments, if you obey me so as to carry them out, then I shall give you rains in season. Go, I'm going to bless your crops. You know, in an agrarian farming ancient culture, that's everything. That's everything. He says, I'll give you rain in due season so that your land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. If the squirrels don't get it. Indeed, you're threshing. I used to have a bunch of fruit trees in my backyard and I used to go out in the backyard. I had a like high powered um, with a scope, like a high powered pellet rifle. And then, but the problem was I lived next to an elementary school. So you got to be careful when you're walking around the backyard shooting squirrels with a scope. And I realized, what am I doing? Because next thing you know, the FBI would be like helicoptering in my yard. Um, Indeed, your threshing will last for you until the grape gathering. So what's, what it's saying here is he goes, you will still be harvesting your fall crops in the spring. It's going to be so abundant. He says, and the grape gathering will last until sowing time. You'll be gathering the spring crops all the way into the, into the, oh, I guess the grape gathering is until the time that it's time to sow seed. Thus, you will eat your food to the full. I love that. It's a good verse. You will eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. So your crops will be blessed. You'll have security. You'll have peace with your neighbors. The basic necessities of life, God goes, if you obey me, you'll be blessed. Okay, and then it culminates with, with, in all of these passages, I don't have it here, he says, I will be your God, you will be my people. The most intimate, important relationship any human can have is with their creator. He goes, and it will be like an open doorway, an open pathway, I will be your God, you will be my people, if you obey me. But then you have the curses of the covenant. The Lord says, if you don't obey me, And don't carry out all of these commandments. If indeed, instead, you reject my statutes and your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry them out, all my commandments, so as to break the covenant. Forgive me for some of the typos in the notes there. It says, I, the Lord, in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over you sudden terror, consummation, fever that will waste away your eyes, cause your soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly. Your enemies will eat it up. I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies. And those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee even when no one's chasing you. You'll be afraid, paranoid. So, essentially, the Lord says you'll have a series of calamities. But then here's how it concludes. Yet in spite of all of this, even Israel, if you're disobedient and I send my chastisements, and look, they're called curses. Theologians, we call them the curses of the covenant. I don't like the word curse because it sounds like something that a witch does or a witch doctor or whatever. Like, I curse you. Like, think of it as chastisements. The chastisements of the covenant. What do we do when our kids disobey? We hopefully punish them well in order to try to teach them life lessons so that they won't hurt themselves more later in life, right? So that they'll learn good lessons. So think of them as the chastisements of the covenant. If you don't obey me, the Lord says, I'm going to try to teach you righteousness. I'm not going to give you all this stuff for free. You're going to have increased calamities, ultimately problems with your neighbors. Your neighbors will invade you. You'll be invaded, attacked, etc., And ultimately, you'll be exiled. In fact, I guess I left that part out. He specifically says, most of you will be killed, and you'll live in the lands of your enemies. And then the Lord says, despite all of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I won't reject them. God goes, I entered into a marriage betrothal covenant, and even when they're unfaithful, I still won't remember because I'm faithful. The Lord says, nor will I... nor will I so abhor them so as to completely destroy them. He goes, when they get invaded, many of them will be destroyed. He goes, but I'm never going to completely wipe them out because I I am the Lord their God. I will remember the covenant that I made with their ancestors. I will remember the promises. God is faithful, period. And God goes, I don't forget my promises. 
And he goes, these are the, um, the covenant that I made when I brought them out of the land of Egypt in the sight of all of the nations, the Gentiles, that I will be their God because I am their Lord. So that's ultimately his purpose is so that they will have this relationship with me. Now, this is what I've got a little, I pulled the chart off the internet. I call, it, I call this the chastisement cycle because it's a cycle. And it's a cycle, by the way, that defines all of us. You know, we commit ourselves to the Lord. We're like, I'm going to go hard. And then whatever, a year, six months, two days later, whatever it is, we backslide. And then we sort of back, and then the Lord corrects us. And then we repent and we come back. And it's kind of this cycle, if you will. Israel experienced this, but in very profound ways. So the cycle begins. God disciplines Israel with various national calamities. And by the way, you can watch these things play out in our nation. Next thing you know, the land ultimately is invaded. So a series of warnings, a series of calamities, your crops fail, this and that, but ultimately they will be invaded. And he specifies all of this in Torah. Moses lays it out in detail. And he says, most of you will be killed, and then you'll be exiled and scattered among the nations. The survivors are exiled from the land. And then eventually the Lord says, but I won't forget you and I'll bring you back to the land. Like it's really specific. I'll bring you back to the land. Now here's the thing. This has never happened to any nation in the history of the world, in the history of mankind, other than Israel. A nation got destroyed, wiped out, ceased to exist, and the few people that were left were scattered among the nations, but eventually they came back and resettled and restored and repatriated and became a nation again. It's never happened. And these things are specific. I mean, these are not just general things. When it comes to making predictions or prophecies, right, you can, like, there are some things that can be faked. There are some things that can be manufactured. There are some things that are too specific to fake. And the fact that this has happened in Israel's history, not once, but multiple times, is a profound validation of the prophecies of Moses. And it's something that very few Christians talk about. So it first happened when the Assyrian armies invaded because Israel broke up into two kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. This was a couple generations after David, Solomon, and then they broke up and they became two nations. Assyria invaded the northern kingdom and dragged away the ten tribes that were in the north. Most of them were killed. They replaced them with, they actually displaced and put other peoples in the land, the Samaritans. And the prophecy was fulfilled with ten of the tribes. Then it happened again with the Babylonian invasion of Judah. Again, most of them were destroyed. The Bible tells the story. They're dragged away, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, etc., Ezekiel, to the land of Babylon. And then it happened again shortly after the New Testament was written with the Roman invasion. And it happened partially, by the way, under Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greek Ptolemaic king. Two complete times, the Babylonian invasion, destruction of Israel, eventually they came back. The Roman destruction of Israel, which unfolded over about 50 years after 70 AD up until the early part of the second century. And then in our lifetimes, they came back again and they repatriated. And that was a big part of the Jesus movement was people were looking at the words of the prophets saying that they would come back. And then they did. And it happened in the lifetime of most of the hippies that got saved in the 70s because Israel was, you know, reestablished 48 and then 67. They took... uh, Yeah, Jerusalem. And so people were going, wow, this is exactly what the Bible predicted would happen. And it's happened multiple times. And so this is a, it's a profound thing. If you're a skeptic, if you're an unbeliever, if you're a backslidden Christian, if you've left the faith, explain that. Explain that. Look at the prophecies in detail and explain how it was self-fulfilled multiple times. It's really, really hard, even if you're the most hardened atheist, to explain that. And if you have a little bit of faith, you go, wow, that's like really specific. It's really, clearly, it has been fulfilled. Now, what is the controversy of Zion? 
The controversy of Zion is something that's clearly taught about in the scriptures, but it's drawn from the prophecies of Moses. I want to look at Isaiah 34. It's, a, it's an oracle, a judgment oracle. It's a judgment prophecy against the kingdom of Edom. And the context is the last days. The Lord says, Draw near, O you nations, and hear and listen, O you peoples. Let the earth and all that it contains hear, and the world and all that springs from it, because the Lord's anger, his indignation is against the nations. Why? His wrath is against their armies. He's destroyed them. He's given them over to the slaughter. The Lord goes, I'm going to judge the nations. And then he uses this clear apocalyptic end time language. He says, all of the host of heaven will wear away. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll. This is common apocalyptic language. The next slide, the Lord says, my sword is full. It's satiated. It's received everything that it wanted. My sword, my heavenly sword is full. In other words, it's descended in judgment on his enemies. He goes, behold, it will descend for judgment on Edom the people that I have devoted to destruction. Why, does the Lord, why is the Lord angry at Edom? Because of their hatred of his people Israel. And then it uses the language of a sacrifice, their land will be soaked with blood and all these things. And then the answer in terms of the, I ask the question, why? Why is the Lord judging Edom? Because the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause or other translations say, the controversy of Zion. The Lord actually says that he is going to judge the nations because of the controversy of Zion. Now this is Isaiah 34. Isaiah wrote this almost 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago, a Hebrew prophet said that that the, the Lord would return, the last days would revolve around controversy over a word, over a, a concept, over a reality called Zion. Zion. <clears throat> Zechariah 14, 1 through 4. Very similarly, the prophet Zechariah says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. He's talking to Israel, and he says, This is what's going to happen. All of the stuff that your enemy stole from you, the spoils of war, it's going to be divided right in front of you. All of your property is going to be divided by your enemies right in front of you. This is the playing out of the chastisements of the covenant. One final time in the ultimate sense, he says it will be divided among you. I will gather all of the nations, all of the Gentiles against Jerusalem to battle. The Lord says, I am going to gather all of the nations to invade the land of Israel against Jerusalem. He says, the city will be captured. The city will be occupied. The houses will be plundered. The women will be ravished or raped. Half of the city will be exiled, but half will remain in the city. Very specific. Very specific. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. It's a strange thing. The Lord goes, I'm going to allow this to happen, and then I'm going to fight against them. As when he fights on a day of battle, and in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is just opposite Jerusalem. So the Lord is coming back to fight on behalf of his people Israel when they are invaded, destroyed, plundered, ravished, etc., the context is clearly the last days. All of the prophets tell the same story over and over and over again. I want to show you a map. This is Israel, of course. Uh, see if you can pull up the neck of that map. Oh, no. Is there a map of a green, um, green and pink? Well, there you go. In the north, so Israel is green, the pink or fuchsia. Um, who made this map? Why did Palestinians get fuchsia? Uh, although um, Ed's got a shirt that would match the Palestinian territories. But just north of Israel is Lebanon. And right now Israel is concerned. We've got friends up there in the Golan Heights. Actually, the Golan Heights should be green. I don't know who made that map. Anyway, and in Lebanon is Hezbollah, which is the most well-funded terrorist organization in the world, Hezbollah. Okay, so they're in Lebanon, and then down there in Gaza, down there in the south, that was the attack, that's Hamas. 
I want to look at the rest of the prophecy. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I skipped Joel 3. Yep. Behold, in those days and at that time, this is Joel chapter 3, 1 through 3, I will restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. The Lord has restored the fortunes of Judah. They're back in the land. He says, at that time, I will gather all the nations and bring them up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's Jerusalem. And I, there I will enter into judgment with them. Why will the Lord enter into judgment with the nations? On behalf of my people, my inheritance, Israel. The Lord says, I'm going to come down. I'm going to step off of my throne and come down and defend my people when they're invaded. My people, Israel, whom they have scattered. And then he goes on again, very specific. He goes, they've scattered them among the nations. They've been exiled. They've become prisoners of war. And then he said, they divided up my land. Again, this is Joel, same time period as Isaiah, 3,000 years ago. They've also cast lots for my people, traded humans, traded a boy for a harlot, sold a girl for wine, human trafficking, trading prisoners of war, very specific. Now again, then the map, now I want to finish reading Joel chapter 3. Same prophecy, the next verse, the Lord goes, what have you against me, O Tyre and Sidon? Tyre and Sidon is Lebanon. The Lord goes, he's talking about the invasion of the nations of the land of Israel in the last days that will spark his return. And he goes, what have you against me, Hezbollah, and all your regions of Philistia? Joel basically called out Hezbollah and Hamas. He goes, what if you guys have against me? He doesn't say, what if you against the Jews? The Lord actually identifies with his people, even though the majority today are not believers. And he goes, what if you against me? What if you, he identifies with his people. He goes, if you think that you're paying me back, if you think what you're doing is about justice, it's about the illegal occupation. He goes, trust me, I will swiftly, speedily return everything that you're bringing on your own head. Karma is a blank. Hallelujah. That's essentially what he's saying. Sorry, I didn't say it, but you get the point. He goes, if you think this is justice, I'm going to bring real justice. The Lord doesn't believe in karma. Okay, that was, that was my joke. All right. um, Ed said I have to always qualify my jokes by saying that was a joke. Saudi Arabia, October 7th, I was down there with a group, and all of a sudden my phone blew up. In 2020, with FAI, we brought a group. Just curiously, was anybody there at the conference? Just anyone in the room in 2020 when we were in Israel? Um, we had a tour. Nobody, anybody in the room? So we brought a tour to Israel in January 2020, and then what? it was not a Christian tour like where you just see all the historical sites. We brought people to the borders of Israel. We went up, look into Lebanon. This is Hezbollah. This is where they were digging tunnels to help Christians understand what Jews live with. We went down to a kibbutz right on the border of Gaza, and we got a tour of the kibbutz, and we said, there's the Gaza. Like, you could look right over. There it is. There's the wall. There's the Gaza Strip. And this Jewish leader of this little farming community explained that so many of their kids have post-traumatic stress syndrome from rockets hitting their kindergarten and this type of thing. And I was just 15 miles from the border of Israel because we were just over the border of Jordan on the southern side of Israel in Saudi Arabia. And on the day, October 7th, that the massacre took place, that kibbutz lost over 20 people. And it's a kibbutz probably a lot smaller than this room. 20 people murdered massacred that day and that was one of the communities that was least impacted down there on the on the border the Lord says if you follow and worship other gods I'm going to bring these calamities on you now I don't know if you all followed what happened October 7th as much as I did because these were people I met people I knew it's a country that I go to regularly that I pray for that I believe has profound biblical relevance but if you watch videos or footage of the concert, because there was a peace concert called the Supernova, 
right on the edge of Gaza. They're all these kids. They're not religious Jews. They're Jews, but they're not religious Jews, and they're dancing, and they're like, oh, look, look at all the things up in the sky. And it was them coming on these little propelled, whatever they're called, paragliders with AK-47s and so forth to kill them. And they're all down there probably tripping out, dancing or whatever, not knowing that they're about to get slaughtered. Here's just one picture I want to show you. So there's the pictures up in the sky. See the picture on the left? That's not Yahweh. I want to be careful when I highlight this. The point is, the people of Israel today are under divine chastisement because the majority are not following his ways, his commandments, his decrees, his instructions. And the judgments that were specified in the Mosaic Covenant are coming upon them exactly as described by God. They're dancing under a giant Buddhist statue and the Lord let their enemies come in and slaughter them. And that was devastating. But what was more devastating to me was to watch the global reaction when, because you go, okay, the Palestinian kids have been brainwashed with anti-Jewish hatred, but our kids haven't been brainwashed with anti-Jewish hatred, have they? But we watched as our kids... They go to university and they get brainwashed. They were in the streets with the Palestinians, essentially celebrating the slaughter, the rape, the massacre, the pillaging, the plundering of Jews. And for what it's worth, if you're in the room and you're not really sure where you stand with regard to faith and all this, and you've been taught that Israel are a bunch of Nazis occupying forces and this type of thing, let me tell you something about Israelis. Israel has more white people with dreadlocks per capita than any nation in the world. That's a joke. (laughs) But it's kind of true. It's a hippie nation of peaceniks, and they're not all white, by the way. That, um, and is there anyone in the room that's white that has dreadlocks? If not, just as a word of advice, no, no. Anyway, that's beside the point. I'm kidding if you do. Some people make it work, but very few. Anyway, um... The point is, it's a nation of peaceniks. They want peace with their neighbors. They're not... Israel had... Okay, so let me just say this. The story of David and Goliath, it's a powerful story in the minds of everyone because everyone identifies, everyone, even T.W., identifies with little David. No one's like, man, I love that story. I wish Goliath killed that punk. You know what I mean? Like, no one identifies... Everyone identifies with the underdog. And everyone identifies with little David that with a little stone killed that giant mocking Philistine uncircumcised scumbag pagan. Yeah, one stone. But what people do is they appropriate that story and they rewrite it. And what the Palestinians have done is they've rewritten that story where they're the little Palestinian kid in front of the big Israeli tank. And everyone sees that around the world and they go, oh, the poor Palestinians. Now listen, Israel does have a powerful military. Do you know why? To protect themselves. It's a defensive military. After the Holocaust, six million Jews exterminated, they said never again are we going to allow the Gentiles to pull this nonsense. They resettled, they built a strong military. It's a pretty natural reaction to people trying to kill you. (coughs) so people appropriate that narrative of David and Goliath and they brainwash and they woo us with their their pain and look there's very real pain but do you know who the primary source of that pain is it's the Palestinian leaders that are multi-billionaires living in their mansions in Qatar and Turkey while they exploit their own people you talk about the one percenters you talk about people who want conflict so they can remain rich. And where do they get all their money? Donations for the poor Palestinian people. The top leader of Hamas is worth over $4 billion. Go to the next slide. This is a massive 
anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian, essentially celebrating the slaughter of October 7th rally. Where do you think that was? That was London. Similar protests happened in New York City and, I mean, all over the world. There was even a anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian protest in Austin, Texas, not Dallas. The entire West has not quite fallen yet. Almost, but in Austin, Texas. Here's a clip of a, um, a news article. After October 7th, millennials and Gen Z women are sharing their conversion to Islam in the wake of the Israel-Hamas war with leftist queer gremlin, that was a TikTok influencer, from Boston among those TikToking her journey. All these progressive leftists and former Christians that have left the faith, deconstructed, were converting to Islam after October 7th, after watching people slaughter and murder, they were converting to Islam. You go, wait, what? It's not just over there, it's in the air. I need to wrap this up. I want to skip forward a few slides to where it says apocalyptic genocidal prophecy. <laughs> That's a strong header. A lot of people think that Hamas is a liberation organization and Israel are the occupying force. And they play off of a lot of the, um, you know, the critical race theory and stuff that's so popular today in universities. But the reality is the Jewish people, who are not all white, by the way, yes, because of history that you have a much higher percentage that are Caucasian. But there's, Israel is a very melanin diverse uh, nation. You know, you've got people of all different colors uh, all over the spectrum. But the Jewish people and all of the tribes of Israel, they are the indigenous people to the land. If you read the Bible, you know God gave them the land. They've been there for thousands of years. Yes, they were expelled, but they came back. They are not an occupying force. That would be like calling the local Hawaiians in Hawaii, that would be like calling them an occupying force. And the people that came there later, you know, the Haoles, the Caucasians, and the Portuguese, and the Japanese and everything, like they're the original people. No, the locals, the Hawaiians are the indigenous people. The Jewish people are the indigenous people to Israel. But the whole narrative has gotten flipped upside down and everyone has championed Hamas like it's some wonderful freedom fighter group. This is part of the charter of Hamas. This is part of their constitution. Now they've since changed it but this is part of their original constitution. And they only changed it because it was bad for PR. This is a prophecy, an Islamic prophecy. It says the day of judgment will not come until the Muslims fight the Jews and kill them. Then the Jews will hide behind a tree or a rock and the tree of the rock will cry out and say, oh, Muslim, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. And then it went on and it said, Hamas exists to fulfill this divine mandate. Hamas was founded. Their constitution says, we believe that God wants us to carry out a genocide against the Jewish people. And when you read the stories of the supernova massacre and people telling their stories, they ran and they hid behind trees and rocks and watch their friends being murdered until they were some either faked being dead or hid themselves under dead bodies. It's almost like this is a satanic prophecy from hell, and they were trying to carry it out. And you have people today that are so stupid, forgive me, so ignorant that they think this is something to get behind. Satan himself has his own prophecies. The Lord says, here's what's going to happen. Israel's going to be invaded. Israel's going to be hated. Israel's going to be despised all over the earth. And then you have this other people who go, yeah, God wants us to kill Jews. And you go, in that right there, I can demonstrate that God is real because look at the earth. Look at what's happening right now. The words of the prophets are being fulfilled, and I can also prove that Satan is real. Because he has his own prophecies, and he's just taken what God says, and he just tries to flip it upside down and say, it's the same thing that God says, except 
I'm going to say the good guys are the bad guys and the bad guys are the good guys. And I'm going to try to champion and say slaughtering Jewish people is a good thing. And people go, yes, it's a cause of justice. I'm going to wrap it up here. We are entering into a season. I'm not talking about so many other details about radical Islam. I could get into that. I was going to show you another picture of a rally in Istanbul, unlike London, which was 1.5 million people with the president of Turkey saying, Israel, because of what you're doing, which is protecting yourselves, we're going to come. He said, in the middle of the night, we're going to come and invade your land. One of the most powerful militaries in the world. President of Turkey, part of NATO, openly saying we're going to invade Israel exactly according to the words of the biblical prophets. So there's a lot of things that we could look at. There's a lot of details, but the reality is biblical prophecy is being fulfilled in our day. And if you're an atheist, if you're on the fence, if you're someone who's backslidden or you're maybe peering in the doorway going, what is this thing all about? Open your eyes and recognize the fact that, yes, this testimony is true. And we Christians, yeah, we can be weird. I get it. <laughs> but so are you. Now, <laughs> people are weird. Let's put it that way. My prayer is that in this season of division and hatred and chaos and Christians deconstructing and leaving the faith and all of these things that the Lord will give us another Jesus revolution and that people's eyes will be open to the reality. Amen. We need it so desperately. So desperately. Lord, have mercy on us. And that as the Lord opens up clarity concerning the words of the biblical prophets and these things begin to be expounded and explained and people look and they go, oh my gosh, ground reality is confirming the words of the Bible that at the same time the Lord will begin to release the power of the Holy Spirit because there's nothing more powerful than when God shows up. Come on up, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Brother Joel. Amen. This is good. Thank you. Thank you. I think in the kind of the we need to be aware of the times in which we live. And I think that is a, a continual uh, admonition from the word that we receive time and time again. And one thing that uh, uh, Pastor Ed is, has taught for many years is that the United States is not the barometer to which we gauge where we are in the end times. I mean, that's just the reality. We look to Israel. We look to see what's going on. And, uh, you know, in a in, a, in about 45 minutes, uh, Joel just kind of put a whole lot of information for us to really take in and understand that there are some things happening right now in the world that are pointing to the triumphant return of a Messiah. And that's where our hope is. And so I know that in times like this, whenever the world seems to be chaotic and it's the reality that it can cause unrest, but even as uh, some guys were just meeting in my office this morning and we were praying, you know, we just were reminded to this fact that our hope remains and relies in the fact that our Messiah is returning. And so we are not without hope in the midst of chaos. Amen? So we are not without, let me say that again, we are not without hope in the midst of chaos. For our hope will be, fully is, and shall be in Christ, in Christ alone. Amen. Stand with me as we come back into a time of worship.